Hello friends, welcome back to Go Agile 6. So last time we started Kanban, we looked at the birth of Kanban and how it got adopted at Toyota production system. So today we will look at how Kanban found its way into IT and how it became one of the popular Agile frameworks. So over time, the Toyota production system gained a lot of popularity globally and so project managers all over the world started trying it in different flavors. But the biggest breakthrough came in software industry. So from 2001 onwards, there were active discussions around Agile, Agile Manifesto and so on, which we reviewed in the previous uh, episodes, right? So around 2005, one gentleman by name David Anderson took Toichi Ono's production system and started applying it in the IT process and came up with Kanban for IT. Predominantly, he called it the pull process. He came up with six principles for Kanban in IT. Visual workflow, limit work in progress, managing the flow, make the process pulses explicit, implement feedback loops, and improve collaboratively. If you observe carefully, few things are becoming prominent in the system. Those are batch size, flow, queue, work in progress. Now let's try to understand these principles with some examples. There are two burger shops here. One is a ready to go burger shop and the other is a custom burger shop. In the ready to go shop, what they're doing is based on historic analysis, they figured a particular type of burger is most popular. Hey, these are just some examples, okay, to help you understand the underlying concept. So don't get into debates that uh, there are McDonald's sells so many types of burgers or Burger King sells uh, uh, so many different types of burgers and so on. We are not building a case study on burgers here. We are just evaluating some examples to understand the Kanban concepts. Okay, coming back. In the ready to go shop, they studied that certain types of burgers are popular and also analyzed that they get lots of people at certain time. Let's say 12 to 1 p.m. So what they do is they will create a number of those burgers and keep them ready just in time by 12. So people walk in, pick a burger, pay and go. So it's very efficient and faster. So they know, so they know in the 12 noon batch, let me make 50 burgers. In 1 p.m. batch, let me make 30 burgers. So the batch size is very crucial here. That determines overall delays, efficiencies and, and even costs. Coming to the right side, custom burger, now a customer walks in, picks and chooses whatever toppings or sides that he or she prefers. So as the customer orders, someone is literally fixing the burger. So it's one customer at a time. There's no concept of some 20 customers picking up and walking away. You see the difference, right? So moral of this is how a batch production and right size of batch boosts your productivity and reduces costs. Now let's look at the flow and capacity. Again, don't get confused. I'm just using the terms as per my convenience, but capacity again can relate to your batch size. Imagine there is a bridge. At any given time, there cannot be more than 100 vehicles on the bridge. That means that is the maximum capacity of the bridge. But technically, you can fit in 200 cars at the same time on the bridge. But just because you can fit in 200 cars if you allow so many to continuously go, then what happens? It can be chaos, traffic mess, delays, accidents, and bridge can even collapse, right? So never maintain at full capacity. You won't have a smooth flow. Agree? Same thing in IT, when you overload a member, it can have many side effects. There's one gentleman, Don Reinertsen, who is the author of a book called The Principles of Product Development Flow. And he quotes in the book, operating a product development process near full utilization is an economic disaster. So what do you do? You try to control the flow. How do you control? One method is you introduce a system of issuing cards uh, to each car that enters the bridge on both sides. Let's call them the North toll gate and South toll gate. Let's say you maintain 100 cards at North. So on North, when cars enter, you issue a card. When they exit at South gate, they are supposed to return the card at that gate. So the South gate operator uses the same cards to issue to cars entering on the South side. And those cards are collected back at North gate when they exit. So by this, what you're trying to do is you're maintaining a steady flow. So it always stays within your limits of 100 cars. That's what we refer to as limiting the workflow. And you can also visualize the workflow with the number of cards that are in your bin. Just take it as an example, okay? So we are just using it to understand our concepts of Kanban. Excellent. Now let's study the queue system. Imagine there's a coffee shop and there are customers walking in to order coffee. Now, when more and more people come in, what happens? The queue becomes longer. If queue becomes longer, what does it translate to? It directly translates to delays in the whole process increases the wait time, quality of coffee could be compromised, there could be some spills here and there, wrong orders can be processed, and the person making it could be demotivated. So many things can happen. So what he's saying is in IT projects, you try to reduce the wait times
So a professor by name John Little developed a formula to measure the average wait time which is you take the average queue length and divide it by average processing time. Don't worry too much to understand the formula and how it applies uh, for now. But generally you just keep in mind longer queues are not good. It leads to longer wait times. It's funny little law deals with long queues. So it makes it easy to remember, right? So the next is making process policies explicit. So what he means is there could be policies uh, established, but unless you explicitly communicate, sometimes it's not of much use. Just to look at an example here, the traffic policies exist, but either they are not communicated properly or not understood. And that can lead to chaos and even accidents, right? That's what you see in the picture. Now, if the same policies are explicitly communicated and made to understand, then the flow gets smoother. That's what we do with uh, traffic cops or traffic lights, right? So that is what the right side picture is. Okay, the next is implementing feedback loops. So feedback loops are a vital part of Kanban. We use feedback loops to tell us if the things we do are effective or, or, uh, or is it making an impact. These feedback loops can be done through a set of meetings with different cadences. You focus mainly on how you're getting things done, how can you do it better, and how you're doing the right things. So there are seven different uh, meetings that Kanban uses uh, for feedback loops. As you can see, it's uh, highlighted with those circles in red. So we don't need to go into details right now because we are not covering Kanban in uh, full detail. But this is just to give you an idea as to how many places or how many instances that you can get feedback. Okay, nice. Typically in Kanban, there's no estimation. It is continuous or ongoing tasks, no time box iterations. There are daily meetings, but focus mainly on the impediments. So the focus is going to be just on delivery based on capacity rather than overloading the developers. If you imagine the number of issues or tickets or tasks that you need to complete, they'll be put into an indefinite pipeline, which, which in agile world, we normally call it uh, backlog. So there's a single indefinite backlog and developers pull the tickets from the backlog and process them. The backlog of items can always be prioritized or reprioritized. So if you see the board in each area, such as input analysis, development, etc., you are pulling only the limited number of tickets from the previous bucket and working on them. How many are you pulling? You are pulling only what you can handle based on your team capacity. If you see the number 6432 on the top, that shows your team capacity in each bucket. So accordingly, you will pull only those number of items from previous buckets. So it's a pull system. Clear, right? So basically you are pulling. It is very evident that Kanban is a good fit for maintenance or service type of projects because it all runs by issues or tickets. You drop the tickets in an indefinite backlog. You can prioritize and put them in some order. Then team pulls the number of tickets they can handle and every group pulls from the previous bucket and it goes on. So that is Kanban in IT. So before concluding, let's look at some of the benefits from using Kanban. Number one, simplicity. By far, this is the least invasive agile framework to my knowledge. Fairly simple, flexible, and easy to execute. You don't need a lot of transition or knowledge compared to some of the other frameworks. In fact, I used this uh, in one of the instances uh, some time back and results were amazing for what we were doing at the time. Shorter lead time. Cycle time is a key metric for Kanban teams. Cycle time is the amount of time it takes for a unit of work to travel through the team's workflow from the moment work starts to the moment it ships. By optimizing the cycle time, the team can confidently forecast the delivery of future work. And also overlapping skill sets also helps to uh, shorten the lead times. You, you're getting a cross-functional skill set. For instance, testing isn't done only by QA engineers. Developers pitch in too. In a Kanban framework, it's the entire team's responsibility to ensure work is moving smoothly through the process. And then focus on priority items. A Kanban team is only focused on the work that's actively in progress. Once the team completes a work item, they plug the next work item off the top of the backlog. Visibility. The Kanban board is pretty straightforward. You know exactly which task is where and it provides a lot of visibility. Continuous delivery is the practice of releasing work to customers frequently. Kanban and CD beautifully complement each other because uh, both techniques focus on the just-in-time delivery of value. The faster a team can deliver innovation to market, the more competitive their product will be in the marketplace. And Kanban teams focus just precisely on that, optimizing the flow of delivery to customers. Then reduction of waste. You are focusing just on the essential items rather than working on some unwanted tasks to the point. So wastage is minimized. The Kanban method seeks to achieve balance between customer demands and business capabilities. This balance between these two is what determines how stable your IT organization is. 
Many times when you lose this balance, that is when you see overworked workforce, uh, productivity going low or uh, quality going low, uh, delivery is getting delayed and so on. So Kanban model helps to get that balance. So with that, we conclude uh, Kanban. Uh, I hope you liked it. I thought this will give a good overview of uh, the whole Kanban system. If you are interested further, you can always uh, get some advanced training in Kanban. And with that, we also conclude this Go Agile 6. We'll meet again soon in Go Agile 7. Till then, stay safe and see you. Friends, welcome back to this Go Agile series part 7. Last time we reviewed Kanban which is one of the Agile frameworks. Today we will review Scrum which is another popular Agile framework. So what is Scrum? In a previous episode we talked about the Scrum Age in the rugby game, uh, the new new product development by Hirotaka and Ikujiro. You remember right? So in early 90s, two gentlemen, Ken Schwaber and uh, Jeff Sutherland, they built a software development approach taking some of the original new new product development principles of Hirotoko and Ikujiro and they started calling it Scrum. So in 2001, Agile Manifesto came and then slowly Scrum started becoming more and more popular. Scrum is again a lightweight framework which gives a lot of flexibility at the same time it's not too light like Kanban and so it became almost the number one Agile framework in the last decade. So in short, Scrum is an agile framework for developing, delivering and sustaining complex products. So initially it was more focused in the software development but then uh, it expanded beyond software development and went into research, sales, marketing and advanced technologies. I want to give a heads up that I am not following the standard bookish type of format for Scrum. I am changing it slightly because I feel this is a bit easier to understand uh, Scrum so please bear with me but we will try to cover most of it over a few episodes. In Scrum, Broadly, there are four things we need to study or understand. One, scrum roles. Two, scrum ceremonies. Three, scrum artifacts. And four, scrum values. That completes the scrum. Scrum roles is basically we are talking of what are the different characters, people, you know, who involve in scrum. The scrum ceremonies is nothing but uh, the meetings, all those different meetings that happen in a typical uh, sprint. And then you have scrum artifacts is the tangible deliverables. Uh, what we expect in a scrum and then you have scrum values so to summarize in scrum there are three roles four ceremonies four artifacts and four values i don't think we can cover all this in one session so let's break it up and distribute across multiple sessions now let's begin with the scrum roles and what do they do scrum team there's a major shift from traditional approach in scrum in traditional model there's a pm or project manager who is very powerful and there's a lot of authority. The team just follows the instructions, no questions asked. There could be hierarchy also within the team. In fact, the team many times don't even know what they're really building and why they're doing and what is the business stake and what is the business impact and so on. I'm saying on average, sometimes some members could be carrying higher responsibility and some lower and there's dependency on few members. Who knows much more and deeper about the project than others. When it comes to Scrum, Entire team owns it. Everyone is expected to know everything. They know the expectations. They know the vision. They know the impact. They know the risks. In short, they are very self-organized. So no spoon feeding. Nobody is going to call them for meetings. Nobody is going to remind them what tasks they need to complete. Uh, they just need to be very attentive and responsible for all of their actions. They collectively take the system forward. They all have equal responsibility. Clear, right? So in short, they are no longer managed, but they are self-organized. Now let's see the different roles of a typical scrum team. You know earlier in projects we used to call project manager, business analyst, developers, testers and so on, right? Now in scrum team it's fairly simple. There are only three types of roles. One is product owner, one is scrum master and then you have the developers. That's it. So let's uh, review each one of them. Let's start with the scrum master. The scrum master knows all the rules of the game. They closely monitor any impediments. Impediments are nothing but blockers. Now to remove these impediments, you may have to coordinate with other teams, other departments like legal, finance, admin, etc. And someone has to coordinate with release management also, external business stakeholders. All this is handled by scrum masters. They are like the spokesperson for the team. Then they will facilitate any meetings required within the team or, uh, or with other teams as required. Don't forget, teams should handle their duties by themselves though. Scrum master is only a facilitator. 
and in other words called as servant master they work to protect the team make sure team has no impediments and work is moving smoothly it doesn't mean scrum master is responsible right the entire team is responsible and they should follow all the requirements and expectations there's no compromise then let's see the product owner a product owner is responsible to gather all the business requirements so it's their responsibility to coordinate with business stakeholders or product managers and they have to make sure that they are aligned with enterprise wide business objectives and requirements and know the exact business value of why a certain feature is being developed or necessary they should prioritize the requirements they maintain the backlog and so on backlog is nothing but again the complete list of all requirements that you keep adding and it's an indefinite long list of items so when team starts working on the development po or product owner should provide all guidance and answer any questions related to what the team is building and the third role is developers of course they are responsible to actually build the product they should be clear about the requirements understand it well should be able to quickly do the necessary breakdown of stories into tasks and so on as we continue we are using number of new terms such as uh, features stories tasks product managers and so on so we will discuss all of them again so don't worry much about it right now nobody tells the developers to attend meetings in time or to keep moving the tasks ensure all stories are completed before the sprint ends they should be very self organized if a scrum master is repeatedly pinging them to join daily stand ups or sprint planning sessions etc that means they are not doing their work effectively coaching can happen only up to a certain extent but it can be babysitting there is a difference so we saw the scrum roles next we will see what are these scrum ceremonies scrum has four ceremonies basically these are nothing but meetings first time when you start learning people think this is some big technical term and there's a definition and you got to understand nothing like that it's just a set of meetings that we call scrum ceremonies there are four such meetings and collectively we call them scrum ceremonies now what are these four scrum ceremonies one daily stand up or we also call it dso daily when you start the day you begin with just a short 15 minute meeting what do you do here each member shares what they have done uh, so far or which is probably yesterday and since you are meeting daily so they convey what they have done yesterday then convey what they are planning to do today and then discuss if they are stuck with any bottlenecks which we call impediments simple right i see in many places they run these meetings for 30 40 minutes and sometimes even an hour but that's not an effective or efficient way once you run these for a month and get used to the scrum ways you should not need more than 15 minutes and if there are some pointed discussions about an impediment or or something else they should have an offline meeting after the daily stand up but invariably they engage all members for that 40 minutes or so which you should avoid and teams should have the self discipline to make sure they join these meetings in time there's a wrong notion that scrum master has to start this daily stand up every day no that's wrong whether scrum master is there or not the team should be responsible enough to start the dsu at the right time sprint planning you will start every iteration with a planning session it will be once in a sprint so daily stand up is daily whereas sprint planning is once in a sprint a sprint is roughly 2 weeks a sprint planning is a bit more detailed where the team goes through the backlog of stories the product owner will be prioritizing the stories and will say okay these seven stories for example are top priority they should be done in the sprint then team goes through each of these seven stories and try to understand the scope ask any questions get clarifications by the product owner and then the team will do some sort of estimation of each story let's spend a minute on what these stories are your stories are nothing but short simple descriptions of a feature told from the perspective of the person who desires the new capability that's normally a user or customer on the in the system generally a simple template is followed so you are building the software for some user or business right just imagine if they explain how they visualize the functionality is nothing but your user story that's why we call user stories but more generally we also call stories so product owners should be well versed with writing user stories in such a way how a business visualizes and also something the team can easily follow and of course the product owner is there to answer any questions or clarifications if team has there are four key elements of a sprint planning ceremony define the scope of the sprint uh, basically you will determine which tasks in the project backlog your team intends to tackle during the particular sprint that are available to work on them and and assess your team's current work capacity uh, that means you are you are factoring all the holidays events or days off so every member should upfront inform if they are taking any offs or if any leaves in that during the sprint 
So accordingly, the Scrum Master can do some sort of capacity planning. Then set goals for the sprint. Establish when these tasks are expected to be completed in your Scrum schedule. What constitutes completion and any other metrics for success you deem necessary. There is something called definition of done. That means teams should plan to make sure all stories meet the done criteria to close them before the sprint ends. And, and uh, we will we'll be reviewing many of these things again, like the done criteria and all that stuff. So don't worry right now. For now, just imagine, like, let's focus on these, these ceremonies right now. Then address concerns. Open the floor up to your team to discuss any roadblocks, issues or potential scheduling issues that might affect the delivery of any backlog items. So to a large extent, this is what you do in a typical sprint planning meeting. So sprint planning meetings are slightly longer. They can go from two to four hours uh, for each sprint. But then during the sprint planning, the team should also be able to break down the stories, each story into tasks. And we'll cover that in detail maybe later. So next we'll go to sprint review. That's the third ceremony. So just like we begin a sprint with sprint planning, we also hold a sprint review at the end of the sprint. What we do here is we review the work product, whatever was developed so far, meaning we will inspect the increment and make sure the product is meeting the expectations. We invite business stakeholders also to be present at this meeting. They provide any feedback and any improvements. So we can adapt to those as we move on to the next sprint and we adjust the backlog also accordingly. So during sprint review, if any new changes are suggested or if any were suggested to be dropped, then product owner will note down and accordingly adjust the product backlog. So in the next sprint, when you go for sprint planning, you are you, you have the right stories to proceed further. And here we are not reviewing some documentation in the sprint review, but it's more of demonstrating the actual tangible product that's been developed so far. And the last uh, scrum ceremony is the scrum retrospective. Scrum retrospective is the scenario where the scrum members come together to do an appraisal of their work. It's a self inspection on how they are executing their tasks. Things like what went right, what went wrong. Uh, what can be improved, what needs to be stopped. Uh, and so these sort of things will be discussed and it will help the team to become more productive as they move forward. So those are the four scrum ceremonies. So now we, we completed scrum roles and then we completed scrum ceremonies. Okay, I think this is good for your first session of scrum. There are so many other things to cover and we will try to catch up with uh, some of the other stuff in the upcoming sessions. So with that, we'll conclude this Go Agile 7 and till we meet again in Go Agile 8, keep practicing Agile. Stay safe and do good. See ya. Hello friends, hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to Go Agile part eight. So last time we covered the first part of Scrum. And before we continue where we left last time, for a change, I want to relate what my friend Srinivas in Australia shared with me. An interesting analogy on how this Agile practice has been there for hundreds of years. Sometimes these little analogies helps us to strongly remember some of the concepts, what we are trying to learn. So he says farmers in India were practicing Agile for hundreds of years. Initially, I couldn't believe it. But then when I heard the story, I found it very interesting. So I thought we'll share that with you. Every morning in a village, all the farmers who work for a landlord assemble at the landlord's house. They discuss about what they did yesterday, their observations, then what needs to be done today and what they need for their work today. Things like uh, any tools, fertilizers, pesticides, whatever. This is just like your daily stand up in uh, Scrum. Then they go out for farming and work all day. And for crops, especially commercial crops like uh, cotton, tobacco, millets, there will always be changes in the crop, especially with pest infections. Those infections spread so quickly that even just a 24 hour delay in action results in some damage. So they need swift action for those changes. So this is something just like how you handle requirement changes and how you respond to change as per the Agile Manifesto. So you are inspecting and adapting to new ways and changes to suit the new requirements. That is what we call inspect and adapt in Scrum. And then during their work in the fields, they normally meet at some point for tea or lunch or smoke, whatever, and discuss about their progress of work and update each other on their impediments. This gels very well with the power of Agile face-to-face -face interactions. And also they try to mix these crops. So there's a constant rollout of the product all throughout the year. 
they may be mitigating the risk not to depend just on one crop for entire year there could be seasonal uh, items too that's somewhat similar to your regular shippable increments right fascinating how the agile connects to it so so the moral of the story is agile is nothing but a mindset many across the world may be already practicing in their own ways and for many 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 years though they may not use the word agile but they are practicing agile just thought we share it so back to our scrum in the last session we covered scrum roles and scrum ceremonies so there are three scrum roles uh, scrum master product owner and developers and in scrum ceremonies we looked at four ceremonies daily stand up sprint planning review and retrospective there is one another ceremony called backlog refining and i didn't cover it last time because backlog refining is not an official scrum ceremony but invariably most of the teams carry out this and it's a useful one in the sprint planning you are taking all certain stories uh calling them sprint backlog and then deep diving and estimating all that you are doing and all that stuff right now imagine if you already did some refinement much before coming to sprint planning where you brainstorm the needs and prioritize to align with enterprise objectives won't it be useful so that is what you do in backlog refining which you will do midway in a sprint clear right so you start a sprint with sprint planning and let's say after a week you 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 meet again for some time to go over the product backlog items that may likely be the candidate requirements for the upcoming sprint so these items can be developed during next sprint by this the advantage is when you go into next sprint planning you don't have to spend much time in identifying what stories for that sprint you can quickly jump into those prioritize stories and start estimating breaking them down into tasks and it's and, and and all that stuff so in a nutshell backlog refining will help you to be well prepared for the next sprint planning session so after scrum ceremonies next is scrum artifacts there are four artifacts and people also call them work products scrum artifacts provide key information that the, that the scrum team and the stakeholders need to be aware of to understand product under development the activity is done and the activity is being planned in the project so what are the four artifacts one is product backlog two sprint backlog three increment and four burn down chart or metrics see now it becomes so easy because we already covered some of these things in the last session uh, while doing this sprint ceremonies we covered a good bit of product backlog last time while discussing sprint planning the product backlog is the indefinite list of all features that are needed as part of the end product and it is the single source of requirements for any changes to be made to the product the product backlog lists all features functions requirements enhancements and uh, fixes that constitute the development or changes to be made to the product in future releases so you will be adding all the requirements or changes here in this long list of backlog and it's an evolving artifact these individual entities that you add into product backlog are called as user stories which we uh, reviewed last time so who is responsible to maintain this product backlog obviously it is the product owner generally those which are in the top have more clarity and more content because deeper discussions must be going on as they are the immediately needed functionality as you go down the backlog you may not have all details and they could be dependent on other parts of the organization or other uh, parts of development or there could be other dependencies which may happen in future clear right the next artifact is sprint backlog so there is a product backlog and sprint backlog it's fairly easy to guess the difference so the product backlog is something that's the long list of uh, open requirements and then in the stories that you shortlist to be developed in the current sprint that's what we call sprint backlog so it's basically there's no difference between product and uh, sprint backlog except the stories which you leave it in the indefinite uh, long list you call it the product backlog and the stories which you shortlist and select to be developed for the current sprint you call them sprint backlog so it is the subset sprint backlog is the subset of product backlog items selected for the current sprint obviously the sprint backlog is a kind of forecast by the team about what functionality will be made available in the current increment and the work needed to deliver that functionality as a working product increment so once you finalize the items for current sprint then ideally you should not make any changes to the scope by any chance if product owner wants any changes scrum master should try his or her best to resist any changes it's generally not a good practice to make changes within the sprint scope churn results in many issues velocity takes a hit project timelines can get disturbed and there are other implications which we will review later when we cover some advanced topics sometimes 
team may request some changes as they are not able to complete for many reasons. That negotiation happens within the team and together with the product owner and scrum master. Team will decide on the best course, whether uh, to drop stories or to replace, etc., etc. But that should be an exception. So the next artifact is increment. The increment is this sum of all the product backlog items completed during a sprint combined with the increments of all the previous sprints. As you move from sprint to sprint, you are accumulating all the completed work after every sprint, right? So that combined product is what we normally call increment. It's a combination of iterative and incremental approach. Earlier, we strictly used to distinguish iterative versus incremental. Best way for you to understand difference between iterative and incremental is, I will use the standard example that everyone uses. Imagine you have to paint a wall. There are two ways you can approach. In an iterative world, you would paint the complete wall with one coat. Next week, you will come back and you will give a second coat and then you will call it done. In incremental world, what you would do is, first week you paint both coats fully on half of the wall. So by the end of the first week, that half portion is fully ready. It's done. So that's it, some sort of finished increment. Next week, you complete the balance half with both quotes and then you call it done. And that's another increment. Basically, within two increments, you are completely finishing the wall, each half separately. Whereas in Scrum, it's a combination of iterative and incremental. That's what many people see it as an advantage. As a process, Scrum gives you the flexibility to be iterative and also incremental. The best way to interpret is in Scrum, you can produce a potentially shippable increment, even though you may not release it, but it could be potentially shippable, meaning it's ready at the same time. And if needed, you can also roll out the increment to some users. So you are getting best of both. So one thing is clear at the end of a sprint, the new increment must be a working product, which means it must be in usable condition, regardless of whether the product owner decides to actually release it or not. But the scrum team should have full consensus on what is considered to be an increment. This varies significantly per scrum team, but team members must have a shared understanding of what it means to work for, for, for them to call the work as complete. That is what we call the done criteria. The last artifact is sprint burndown chart. Basically, this is one chart which tells you how much work is left in the sprint. Every day when you see the chart for a quick minute, it can show if the work is correctly progressing with the rest of the days left in the sprint, which only helps you to track the progress right towards the sprint goal. I'm not going into a lot of detail at this stage because I'll see if I can cover all metrics again at some point. And the last is Scrum values. By the way, last time I think there was a typo and I just mentioned four Scrum values, but actually it's five Scrum values, not four. So what are the five Scrum values? They're commitment, courage, focus, openness, and respect. Commitment. The Scrum value of commitment is essential for building an agile culture. Scrum teams work together as a unit. We saw that enough, right? This means that the Scrum team trust each other to follow through on what they say they are going to do. When team members are not sure how work is going, they ask. Agile teams only agree to take on tasks they believe they can complete. So they are careful not to overcommit. So Scrum Masters have to pay great attention, particularly during sprint planning, to make sure team commits what they can deliver. Likewise, product owner also stays committed to avoid scope churn during a sprint. It's not just like that make you know ad hoc changes to the scope in between a sprint the next one is courage the scrum value of courage is critical to an agile team's success scrum teams must feel safe enough to say no agile teams must be brave enough to question the status quo when it hampers their ability to succeed in our uh, older culture we are used to saying yes to everything and that results in wrong commitment and failed delivery so teams should feel safer to put their thoughts openly uh, same way, Scrum Masters also should have courage to negotiate and sometimes put their foot down when unreasonable demands come from the business or if there is lack of support from other teams where there are certain dependencies. It boils down to the culture and leadership of the enterprise to create that safety in the environment. So the next is focus. Focus is one of the best skills in a Scrum team. Focus here means whatever the team starts, they have to finish it. They should not leave it halfway. You remember we discussed about work in progress earlier. So scrum teams should always be cognizant of the fact about limiting the work in progress. And focus is one of the best skills scrum teams can develop. 
Scrum Masters again have a great role in encouraging teams focus by holding them to their own definition of done. And this starts right with your daily scrums. By being punctual, by attending every daily scrum, by tracking the burn down chart, teams can be more focused to stay on target. Next is openness. Openness is a good quality even generally too. Scrum teams uh, consistently seek out new ideas and opportunities to learn. When they have some issues or difficulties, they should communicate openly and seek help. Scrum masters play an important role to facilitate openness in daily scrum, so team is exactly aware of how they are progressing. There is no hiding of the challenges. Likewise, even during sprint review, the stakeholders' feedback should be constructive in a way the team understands and adopts to the changes. Finally, retrospective is an event where teams should be very open and talk honestly on what went well, what didn't go well, etc. Scrum Master is again has a great responsibility in encouraging openness. Next is respect. It's all the more important that Scrum teams demonstrate highest levels of respect. Agile development is all about collaboration. Everyone is equally important. Everyone has ideas and opinions. So members should have utmost respect for everyone else. Sometimes people may lose patience or may have a bad day and teams should be understanding and respect each other. On the same token, when there is an accomplishment, no matter how small, they should openly recognize and appreciate any accomplishments. Again, a matured scrum master should play an important role to inculcate that respect in the team. You may be thinking that these values all look very broad and generic we hear all the time. True, but scrum founders did a good job by incorporating these values also as a major part of scrum theory. Because all said and done, attitude matters a lot. And these values certainly help bring right attitude which will have great results in the long run. We reviewed in Kanban that making policies explicitly is a key thing. So here Scrum founders are explicitly conveying that there are some things called values and you better get aligned with these values if you want to be in an agile world. So once again to summarize, Scrum has four things mainly, Scrum roles, ceremonies, artifacts and values. So with that we covered the main overview of what a Scrum is. Now there is a lot of additional Scrum related stuff and we will try to cover some if not all in the upcoming sessions. By the way, I'm getting lots of private messages appreciating the series and the content. My humble request to all, a comment would be very motivating, but at the least, if you can like the video, it's highly appreciated. Because my only earning that I eagerly look forward to is your comments and likes. So with that, we will conclude this Go Agile 8. And till we meet again in Go Agile 9, take care, stay safe and happy coming. See ya.